Good morning, and welcome to the CTSC webinar for September 25, 2017. I'm your host, Jeanette dopp -Heidi. CTSC is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about CTSC can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Demystifying Threat Intelligence with CERN's Romaine Wartel. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box in the Adobe Connect window. And we try to allow for time at the end of the presentation for questions as well. And having said that, I will hand the microphone over to Romain. Welcome, Romain. Hello. Thank you very much, Janet. Hello, everybody. So today uh, we'll discuss about threat intelligence and demystifying some aspect of threat intelligence. Um, as Janet was explaining, uh, feel free to type any question you may have on the webinar chat, and I will try to uh, engage with you in a conversation and, and discuss a bit the items which you think are, are relevant. So let's dive into uh, threat intelligence. First, I would like to start with a, a definition, which uh, is a, typically a personal concept in this area. And you may find different definitions according to the source and context you, you'll be uh, looking at. So in this definition, I propose that we treat today threat intelligence as a series of indicators of compromises, like IP addresses, uh, file hashes, etc., etc., joined with contextual information uh, about these indicators, and also joined with uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures used uh, by uh, a specific malicious actor. And this whole set of information will be what we define as threat intelligence. The goal is to enable the recipient of this uh, data to take action either as a preventive measure to uh, prevent um, an intrusion or uh, an incident to occur, but also uh, to use it as a remediation against ongoing or past attacks uh, for forensic purposes. Examples of indicators um, typically include IP addresses or domain names. Um, uh, there are some limitations there. For example, they may be shared or used for legitimate purposes or recycled. So some uh, um, of these indicators have to be treated a bit carefully. Uh, however, they will be easy to use. Some other indicators may be file in or file hashes. Uh, however, again, they might be trivially changed uh, by the attacker. Um, but again, they are easy to use, so they may be uh, very valuable. More complex indicators include the error rules, regular expressions, etc., etc. So with this, you have a less chance of false positive if you're searching for them. Uh, but they are most a bit more costly to use and require a bit more um, processing power or resources to, uh, to be used. Uh, more and more these days, we also include uh, email headers and fields very commonly uh, in the indicators of compromise. Uh, this uh, is now a typical infection vector by uh, uh, many attacking groups. So, after this definition and some example of compromise, uh, sorry, indicators of compromise, uh, the main question people typically have about threat intelligence is where can I um, get it? I mean, what is the best way to get uh, threat intelligence? And obviously, there are no shortage of sources. There are many ways you can uh, get threat intelligence. Um, you can get it from public feeds, raw or filtered. Um, you can pay for them directly. Um, and many security vendors will uh, sell you feeds that contain, contain threat intelligence. Um, you may find uh, blends of private and public feeds that are for sale. You also have directly um, appliances that can be uh, purchased. So this is basically hardware where you cannot see uh, the intelligence at all. Uh, you just send the data to this uh, system. And then if you have any positive match uh, with proprietary indicators, then you will receive an alert. So all in all, you have to wonder, is this a good investment? Um, will this catch more uh, low threat, sorry, low risk threats an internet background noise or really targeted attacks. Uh, what will be my false positive rest, right? So all of these are have to be taken into account. And to help make a decision, there are really two important parameters that uh, have to be taken into account. The first one is really relevance. 
I mean, uh, actors are continually, continuously changing uh, parameters of their attack. It's very easy to do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, IP addresses can be changed, file hashes can be changed. And what we see is that uh, most actors change at least partially the infrastructure for each campaign. And one campaign is typically one day. So uh, every day you will get new indicators. And a lot of malicious actors these days rely on fast flex DNS infrastructures as well, which means um, most victims will get different um, indicators. Um, the domain name generators can also be used for um, command and control. So again, uh, they are, it's very difficult to keep track of the domain names that are being used by the attacker. The email content may be randomized. We, we will have randomized mail headers. Um, Randomized payload as well, so the file hashes and file name will be different. So all of this make it very, very difficult to track. And uh, when you have I, once you have uh, indicators of compromises, then um, you have to really make sure they are still relevant to the attack. Another aspect of relevance is um, more cultural: is how is this intelligence relevant to my sector, my local configuration and location? Um, also, is it actionable? Is this something I can process and and get results out of? Um, is it reasonable to expect a low or at least a manageable false positive rate for this intelligence? Uh, and these are very important questions um, whenever considering buying a feed, for example, or subscribing to a service. Another crucial aspect, of course, is, is quality. Uh, we started to, uh, to discuss with, uh, with relevance. So, a so because uh, some malware does something malicious doesn't necessarily mean it's good threat intelligence. For example, often malware contacts 8.8.8.8, which uh, you may know is uh, one of the Google's public DNS server. And it is true that the malware contacts this DNS server uh, every time it is launched, but it is really uh, an indicator that you, you want to put on your network to detect for intrusions? Probably not. So it means that uh, the behavior of the malware requires careful manual human analysis before flagging as an indicator that you will want to use in your intrusion detection system. And um, also, the intelligence has to be targeted enough. Uh, and in this respect, uh, the more details you have about the URL, the better. For example, we typically see uh, malware or malicious activity from very popular services like Dropbox or SharePoint.com. And if you just have the name SharePoint.com and you decide to raise an alert or block or, or take some action on this domain, you may have obviously a very high rate of false positive. But if you manage to get targeted intelligence, i.e. the full URL, um, then you can get something which is a bit more uh, interesting and then you will have a much lower rate of false positive. Timeliness is a, a third very important parameter when it comes to threat intelligence. Uh, because obviously, uh, when your um, malicious cybercrime uh, operation uh, is multi-million dollars, you will want to know what the companies are doing about your, your attack and how it is tackled. So also, you can also subscribe to uh, threat intelligence feeds and, and know what people are, are, are doing. So it means that as an attacker, you can adapt. And um, when you're trying to defend your network, you, you want the information as quickly as possible and make sure that it is still useful when you receive it. Um, also, domains and IP addresses get reassigned quickly, as I was explaining before, or getting relevant, especially for IPv4, which means that if your intelligence arrives too late, then you may have false positive because the IP address or domain have been now reused by somebody else um, who may not be malicious. Also, uh, people tend to treat um, malicious IPs or domains as malicious forever, but um, in the modern world, um, hosts are getting cleaned uh, pretty quickly, uh, especially for the large cloud providers. And you, you may have a high false positive rate if you start uh, blocking IP addresses or domains uh, that belong to them. So in this context, I mean, we have seen that um, you really want uh, threat intelligence because this is really helpful, but you have this uh, relevance and quality issues to manage uh, and, and you have to make very conscious decisions and choices. So who can really provide uh, relevant uh, quality information in, in this sector? Well, for this, um, we have to go back to the basics. Let's go back to our community. So it is clearly established 
that research and education is a viable market for cyber criminals. I mean, most studies uh, report that this sector is the one that is offering one of the most favorable, favorable cost to benefit ratio for many bad actors. Uh, it's very easy to launch campaigns involving ransomware, finance fraud, etc., etc., in our community for various reasons. And no matter uh, what the profile of the attacker is, should it be cyber criminals motivated by money, hacktivists, or nation state attacks, um, the attacks we will observe are getting more and more complex and more and more sophisticated. So the real question is can your organization or project defend against a nation state? or an international criminal gang with a multi-million dollar budget. I mean, most of us cannot, and this is just not affordable to have this fight. Uh, we don't have the resources, uh, we don't have the expertise, we don't have the time, this is not our mission, and this is clearly not affordable. However, as a community, we're much better positioned. And then, this is where sharing information, expertise, and threat intelligence become a key asset to defend uh, against this this threat. So, um, I really don't personally see threat intelligence as a service. And if you're not into the threat intelligence business, this point is perhaps the most relevant of this webinar, is that I really see threat intelligence as an expression of a trust relationship. Right? This is the response to a threat uh, as a community. And this is really our best means to fight against sophisticated adversaries at a cost which is manageable uh, for us as a community. So now, to go back to the question is how do you get threat intelligence? Well, the first step is really to build a cohesive community where you have a strong trust relationship between the different participants and you enable the participant to share sensitive information in a way that makes them all comfortable. Then you also enable the participant to act on the intelligence and also share back. And this part, as we'll see later, is clearly difficult. While building a community, it's a, very important to bring added value um, so that people get interested and share uh, by adding extra expertise, uh, if at all possible, provide the tools necessary, and also to build strong ties with the rest of the internet security community. It's very likely that some attackers targeting um, NSF uh, project also target similar projects in Europe or in Southeast Asia or in other places. So, Having strong ties enables information sharing between these different communities and provides um, a very uh, strong asset. One important message for uh, people who already know about all this and are involved in threat intelligence already is that one key to success in threat intelligence is to mix uh, participation in different communities, in particular both at the local and global level. So, Small local trust group can provide very targeted and tailored attack, uh, the attacks uh, indicators or intelligence um, regarding a specific area. Um, I don't know, maybe uh, South California or some specific uh, scientific sector. And it's very important to have these local groups um, uh, together and benefit from the information that has been shared there. But also, global internet forums can provide insight uh, against global groups, which are also targeting most communities and most people around the globe. So mixing these local and global uh, forums provide a very strong um, asset and a, and a, a balanced uh, blend of expertise and, uh, and threat intelligence. In reality, um, I expose here a, a diagram of how things tend to work. Um, there are two real ways intelligence is, uh, threat intelligence is shared between uh, participants. So on top of the diagram here, uh, you can see project-based sharing, whereby uh, people come together and form a community where they would like to exchange um, threat intelligence information. And their membership is based on affiliation. So each big project or organization or scientific institute uh, can appoint somebody to participate there and share and provide expertise and most importantly, threat intelligence back to the project or organization. Um, but there is also a large amount of uh, intelligence being shared in ad hoc uh, working groups where the membership is based not on your affiliation or uh, your employers, but on peer vetting. So it's you as an individual 
uh, was entitled to participate uh, in these groups. And this is usually where the higher quality information is available. And this group may involve a wide range of uh, different uh, participants from security vendors, private sector, uh, law enforcement, government agencies, security researchers, various interest groups. And by sharing information and collaborating with the different groups, you can uh, receive threat intelligence that enables you to take action and be protected against some of the threats to your uh, project or organizations. Of course, the difficulty is um, how to go from um, the membership based on affiliation uh, project to ad hoc sharing, where this is peer vetting. And it's particularly challenging when organizations have a high turnover of employees, so uh, it's very difficult to maintain an individual who can participate in these ad hoc uh, working groups. An example of success of the um, project based working group is a WISE community uh, with membership um, in the US, but also in Europe and uh, soon in Southeast Asia, where various research communities uh, have decided to come together and join forces, uh, in particular to um, handle incident response and to share threat intelligence, but also look into a risk assessment and other aspects of um, computer security. So now I would like to um, dive into something slightly more technical, because I've seen that some people uh, who participate today are of a bit more um, a technical background. And I will um, explain a bit uh, one of the technical tools that we use to share threat intelligence um, during, uh, in, in various um, collaborate, collaboration working groups and forums, in particular in Europe, but also in the US. So the tool is called MISP. And when, well, what it does is basically enable uh, people to report uh, on the portal or on the website um, various indicators of compromise, like the one we've described earlier. Um, so this includes maybe IP addresses, domain, email headers, uh, all the details we've mentioned before. You can also add context about uh, the data that has been added. Um, or various tags or various ways, and it works in a way that enables relationship to be built, dif built between different um, indicators that have been entered. So basically, if you um, enter one specific indicator, then if it's this indicator has been seen in multiple different by multiple different participants, then it can be correlated. So you have this all this link between the different events that contain different indicators that are available. So to give like a concrete example, if um, I enter into MISP, a uh, particular Drydex uh, indicator that we have seen um, at CERN, and then uh, somebody else um, in the US has seen the same IP address, but in another context, and MISP will enable these two threats to be connected together, and then we'll have a much better understanding of the, uh, of the situation. So this is um, another example of what you can see with MISP. So this is uh, um, a particular uh, event called Octopus Rex. Uh, and then you have all the metadata information about the event, who can access the information, how can it be shared, um, a list of hashes, um, with all the network uh, related indicators, the context, et cetera, et cetera. So when this is added into the system and published, then people can receive it in different formats um, that can be then uh, integrated directly into their intrusion detection system or correlation engine or, or whatever. So people find the flexibility of the tool um, uh, pretty interesting. Another um, example here um, of MISP is that you can directly import um, in free formats a lot of the information. So you don't have much to do um, uh, to fill up the different forms or different parameters of the website. You just uh, copy paste some text and then it will filter out the important information. So at this point, I should highlight that I don't have any stake in the MISP uh, project, or I don't um, get funded or linked uh, with these people in any way. I'm just reporting that this is uh, the tool that is currently dominating uh, this market in the various uh, trust groups and forums uh, that uh, we see uh, in Europe and some global uh, forums too. So, 
we have seen so far that uh, there are different ways uh, you can build uh, threat intelligence, but probably the most relevant way is to uh, do it as a community to fight complex uh, and sophisticated attacks. And there are tools you can use, and if you have the right trust relationship in place and people are happy to share, then you can make this information available. Um, but sadly, this is uh, not sufficient because what you really want is people to take action based on threat intelligence. And acting on uh, indicators is a really, really important challenge that is very often overlooked uh, by projects and, uh, and, and different collaborations. So in order to uh, act on threat intelligence, each participant in the, in the group must first connect enough information locally. So they must have uh, access to network flows, local logs, email headers, etc., uh, etc. Then they have to accumulate, parse, and incorporate uh, incoming threat intelligence using MISP or whatever other systems you have in place. And then they have to correlate the local information they have and these indicators. And of course, when the correlation is done, they have to take appropriate action and manage false positive, um, if any. And, and this is extremely difficult. And not only this is this a technical challenge, but this is uh, also a people uh, or cultural uh, challenge too. First, because security teams are already busy with other things, typically, so having them to look at more threats or more uh, different indicators may um, pose some problems, and this is something we see very often. Another uh, issue is that not all of the local data, uh, like network flows or local logs, may be within reach of um, the team that is in charge of the system, so there may be legal barriers or technical difficulties in collecting the information. Uh, and this is something we see uh, very often. The legal aspect is, uh, is, um, is a recurring issue, especially in the US, where uh, sometimes scientific projects are hosted slightly outside of the campus. So they have their own computing infrastructure, although they share the same network. And so it's very difficult for some of the security team to get access to the information that would be useful. Uh, and the third uh, issue that sometimes you need the cooperation between different teams to correlate all the right part of information, which may mean um, teams located in different locations or funded by different streams, uh, and this is posing all sorts of issues when it comes to collective, collecting uh, sensitive uh, information. So, ideally, uh, one, one schema we would like to have is that each university or research partner or research laboratories would have the following um, mechanism. First, a way to collect indicators of compromise, which here I um, uh, shorten into IOCs. Then they also have the capability to collect uh, and aggregate uh, local information, so system logs, network logs, uh, in the local container. Then we have this correlation engine that we have to build, and based on the findings and the false positive rates, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then you could trigger instant response. And one thing that a community could do is try to propose a generic implementation or a template or reference um, um, proof of concept or whatever mechanism to enable all participants to work um, with a similar mechanism or architecture. The goal being that at the end of the day, you would have a number of different participants in the same uh, community that have a similar uh, setup and then could share uh, via various trust groups or trust frameworks um, different uh, indicators of compromises. And if you do this, then I think you have a very strong uh, uh, threat intelligence-based community and you, you are very well positioned to fight sophisticated and complex attacks. So you have to build this trust, you have to enable people to share the intelligence um, and collect it, but also to take action whenever uh, something is, uh, is detected. So I will not go too much in the details, but uh, again, I see some technical people in the room. So I'll briefly give you a, a flash of what we're doing uh, at my employers um, with regard to this. So we use MISP for um, intelligence uh, collection and aggregation. Then uh, we use uh, HDFS and Elasticsearch to collect uh, what we hope to have uh, two terabytes per day worth of information. We're working really hard on this at the moment. Uh, and then we also work on the correlation engine, of course, um, 
Um, for this, we use Bro, which is very prevalent in the US, and most of you will be familiar with Bro. Uh, this is not something that is widely used in Europe, so um, it's uh, important to highlight that uh, in Europe currently, we have a lot of people using this, but very, um, a very low adoption rate for Bro at the moment, whereas I think in the US it's uh, quite the opposite, which is very interesting and shows potential for collaboration. So uh, our priority is really to have an active engagement in several vetted trusted groups. So for example, we would work with uh, people in the private sector and collaborate with them and benefit from their expertise or intelligence in some specific area or again, specific uh, threat groups and would integrate this directly um, in our system. One important finding that we uh, have made is that uh, the majority of the uh, incident or intrusions we uh, we worked on are really directly reported by external trusted peers. So this system is really by far the best intrusion detection system that we've ever built uh, in our team. So I'll flash this last diagram of a more realistic view of our uh, system in place. And if you have any question about this, you can contact um, LiveView, I put this detail here, or we can discuss uh, after the webinar. Um, if you would like to have more information about uh, the specific um, implementation we have. So in conclusion, if you come back to threat intelligence, it's very possible to simply purchase or get uh, threat intelligence uh, uh, paid for or free, but quality and relevance are really key aspects that um, shouldn't be overlooked. Attackers are often well-resourced and equipped, and the best and perhaps only way to defend uh, in an affordable way is to do that as a community. And for this, uh, threat intelligence is really an output of a community response. This is really an expression of a trust relationship, as I was saying earlier. For this to happen, it is absolutely essential to support communities and, and all the research collaboration in building trust between its participants, creating and sharing value with regard to threat intelligence, provide support on technical issues, and most essentially connect to others in Internet Security Trust Loop, who would be happy to discuss and share information with participants from these research communities. And on this, uh, I'll be happy to take any question you may have. So I'm just going to give, um, oh wait, here we got a question from Jim. Great. Um, what is a good first step for getting started with threat intelligence sharing, especially for a busy sysadmin of a science DMZ or other science projects in IT infrastructure? So if you really want to get started, the first step would be to connect within your own organization. That is, discuss with your security team, see how your uh, security team is connected with other teams uh, um, locally or at a national or international level. And maybe this is, I mean, can bring connections from uh, the science point of view or its own project and expand the connections from the security team. Once you feel that your connections are well established or you have enough trust in place, then the natural next step will be to express this in the form of sharing information. And then you have multiple tools you can use for this purpose. Great. And um, do we have any, any more questions from the audience? Uh, I'll let you guys, oh, you guys are typing fast today. Great. Uh, what from Terry? What if anything prevents bad actors from submitting bogus data to MISP to MIST? So MIST is a, is a platform for sharing uh, for intelligence, and just like basically HTTP is a protocol. So of course, bad actors could have their own MISP instance or share bad information within MISP. But again, you would have to have a trust relationship with the bad actors first. Um, and that is not something that is very common. So typically, uh, MISP instance would be set up by trusted parties, uh, a government, uh, a project, a collaboration, an organization. And you, can ex you, can, you should expect that um, information added there has been checked by uh, somebody you have a direct trust relationship with. So to answer your question, if bad actors manage to inject bogus data to MISP, then it means you had a, a failed trust relationship with somebody responsible for the MISP instance. Just to be very clear, MISP is just a platform and doesn't contain data as such. 
in MIST, you, as, you are the one adding the information, you or your trusted peers. Here we've got a question. Okay, Terry. Okay, thanks. I see MIST is just a tool. Trust relationships must be established first. Um, we've got a question from Thomas here. What are some of the best ways to vet threat feeds? So uh, again, the, the question probably is more what is the best way to vet uh, trust groups or, or security forums? It really depends on the relationship uh, you have with the people that are composing this group. They may also clarify whenever they are setting up this MISP or this, uh, this MISP instance or these feeds, what quality um, insurance they put in place. There are currently public MISP feeds you can get, so you, you can install your, your own MISP instance and get information directly from the MISP uh, community, but then the quality inside is probably not as high as you would you would it to, you want it to be, but maybe uh, you have a local trust groups um, next to uh, where you live that it's only Vincent, and then they would make sure and guarantee that they have checked that the information is to the best of their knowledge and legitimately malicious, and will have a very low false positive rate. To give a specific example, in the MISP instance we have built at CERN, we have we receive information from multiple. Um, people using MISP, and we do not grant the same level of trust to all of them. For some of them, we would, for example, enable automatic blocking, which is a very serious action. So if they put something in their MISP feed, then we'll say, okay, we trust them enough that we want some automatic action to be taken on our network. But this is definitely not going to be the case for the other sources uh, we have in MISP. It is all based on a trust relationship we have with the MISP information provider. Do we have any more uh, questions from the audience? I'll go ahead and um, let people type and just go over a couple of uh, business items. Uh, first, we have a survey we would like people to take. Um, I, I'm moving it over here to the, to the screen right now. There's a hyperlink there. Please uh, give us some feedback and tell us if you would like to present or if you would like to recommend someone to CTSD to follow up with. Uh, and then we also have a few links here. Um, I've got some contact info here for, from uh, Romain, so you can contact him if you have uh, follow-up questions or if you want to speak with him offline. And then also um, we've got the links to the WISE community and to the MISP uh, threat sharing. Uh, site. And then uh, in addition to that, I just want to mention, whoops, let me fix this real quick. There we go. I just want to mention that um, our next uh, webinar is going to be October 23rd at 11, and the topic that month is going to be the state of the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, uh, and it's presented by CTSC's Von Welch. And uh, let's just Let's do a last call for questions from the audience. I would also be happy to discuss with a participant offline if you would like to have a, a more private discussion on, on this topic. Yes, thank you for saying that. So if you want, to, if you don't feel comfortable speaking more specifically about your situation publicly, Romaine is available privately. Absolutely. Okay, well, I think, I think we, um, we've taken all the questions that we're going to take publicly. So I wanted to th thank you again very much, Romaine, for presenting. And um, with that, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.